PC password file itself. Um, apparently, the Ubuntu default login manager does not allow you to log in as root. And so when I saw that my user ID had uh, ID zero, it caused it to not allow us to log in. Uh, so lesson learned. Don't just decide to start editing important system files in the middle of a class demo. Um, but yeah, that's all done. So let's keep going because I want to get to get through some more abilities today. So we get to some of the meat of what we're talking about here with application security. So what was important about SetUID? What is SetUID?
Okay, so now we want to get into more of the specifics. Okay, how do we start to break applications? So what were some of the phases that we talked about? How would you go about breaking a system in general? Recon. Yeah, before you, well, so you may need access. Yeah, if you can't access it, it's hard to break into it. Right? But we need to get, we need to perform some reconnaissance so that we can understand what the system does. So part of doing that with an application is trying to understand, okay, what does the code of this application actually do? Right? And remember we talked about the program likely written in, let's say, a high-level language like C or C++, which has been taken by a compiler and compiled down to some x86 assembly code, which is then compiled down to machine code that actually is executed. So but the idea is, hey, we, we don't want to just try to look at and analyze the ones and zeros of the program itself. right? We want to look at some more semantic meaning behind the programs. Uh, so disassembly is this whole idea. You can think about it as the opposite of assembly. Right. Assembly takes, well, depends on the way you look at it. What we look at is assemble, an assembler takes an assembly text file and outputs machine readable code, ones and zeros. A disassembler takes machine readable code and turns it into text based assembly. So it's something for you to understand. Um, the way they do these, there are different types of disassemblers. At a high level, some of them, like object dump, will just try to disassemble everything linearly. So why is this difficult? Why, why might this be difficult? What type of instruction set architecture is x86? One, I mean, the instructions are variable size, so that might affect your... <clears throat> yeah, so the problem is we just have a series of bytes, and we're trying to move backwards to see what are the corresponding assembly instructions for these bytes, right? If you have a language like MIPS, which has fixed instruction set architecture, so every instruction, I actually don't know what exactly it is, but every instruction is a certain number of bytes, and there are only that many bytes, right? With x86, you can have instructions that are one byte, or instructions that are, I actually don't know what the limit is, I've seen you can have five, six, seven, eight bytes. Right, so if I just give you a bunch of bytes and I say, turn this back into assembly code, what do you have to know to be able to do that? The length of each instruction. Yeah, you need to know where to start, right? Because if you start at the very first byte, that may decode into an instruction that's two bytes long, and that may decode to an instruction that's five bytes long. Whereas if you start at the second byte, now you have completely different instructions, right? And that would be unique disassembly for every single byte you could possibly start with. So this is why it's really important. So linear disassemblers start at the main entry of the function and just start disassembling. Recursive disassemblers try to be a little bit smarter, so they will see Okay, start disassembling here. Oh, this is a jump to some other part, or a call to a function. So now I know that's the start of some new code, so I should start disassembling from there. Um, honestly, when you're just trying to disassemble a binary, object dump is totally fine. You won't find any weird offset bytes. Um, and so I pretty much always use uh, object dump when I'm doing that, or some other tools that we'll talk about. There are other tools that you can use for disassembly that can make working with the assembly language and trying to understand the binary a little bit easier. Uh, Radaware is a cool program analysis tool, so it actually has a whole library that you can call from Python to do cool disassembly things of binaries. Um, it has some reversing capabilities and some vulnerability analysis. Uh, it supports scripting, so to me that's the coolest part. So you can incorporate this. I had a student. Uh, working on a project that involved analyzing the binary and trying to automatically draw what the stack usage would like using RightAware, so stepping through the program and, and looking at that. Uh, and it's free, which is always nice. Just like object dump. Object dump is free. 
Item Pro is on the complete other side of the spectrum. So Item Pro is the industry standard, state-of-the-art tool for binary reversing. Um, you can get it here. It is, uh, it does not only binary disassembly, so it also shows you in this kind of nice view of branches. So each branch instruction, you can see, so it's a little bit more of the graph of the program flow. Um, it also, like a lot of these, you can put comments in your code to kind of as you're going through it to see what's going on. It also supports decompilation. So decompilation, right, is the opposite of compilation. So it takes an assembly file and tries to generate C code from that. Um, the, and it actually has a lot of, you can actually integrate it into debuggers. So you can see exactly what's going on in the memory as you're looking at the code with all your annotations. Uh, it is a commercial product that is incredibly expensive. And when I'm talking about incredibly expensive, I'm talking, I believe if I remember one, so just item pro itself was I believe three or four thousand dollars. Is that right? And then, and that's for one, no, no, that was I think X64. So that handled a lot of different computer architectures that you could analyze. But hex rays decompiler was I think on the order of $4,000 per language that you wanted to decompile, so per instruction set. So x86 was $4,000, uh, x86-64 was $4,000, ARM is more too, and I think different versions of ARM. Uh, it's also, so they do have a limited, reduced version that's available for free if you want to check it out. Uh, I will say it's also really pain to use. Like it is, if you're looking for a nice user-friendly program, Ida Pro is not that program at all. Uh, there's even uh, Chris Eagle at the Naval Postgraduate School wrote a book on how to use Ida Pro, basically. Like it's the manual that Ida Pro does not have uh, of how to actually use it correctly. Uh, so, to be honest, I've used Ida Pro in the past. It's fine. Um, I actually switched to about a year ago, I switched to this tool called Hopper. Um, but I still use Object Up because it still works really well. Um, but I use Hopper, Hopper's nice. It's uh, a disassembler that supports, uh, that's pretty cool analysis. Um, I think if it's still the case, you actually can't access the Hopper website from ASU's network. Um, and I alerted them to this fact, and they said, well, it's on a the IP is actually blacklisted by ASU, apparently, because it's hosted on a shared hosting site. And so I emailed the author of this, and he was like, well, I can't move sites or anything, so he's just leaving it. I don't know. Uh, so you can access this at home. I don't think it'll work on the ASU network. Uh, it actually has a decompiler. It is a commercial product as well, but it costs $100 if you want the full version, which compared to $10,000 is a lot. I mean, it's a good. Plus it has a free version that has, I think, a half hour restriction, so you can use it uh, up to a half an hour and then it'll shut down, so uh, that's also pretty good. And I believe it runs on Linux and Mac. I don't know that it runs on Windows, maybe. It does or does not? It does not. Is it Mac only? Oh, well, pretty nice though. Okay, so these are kind of tools, right? So these are tools you can use to try to understand what the program is trying to do, right? But there's no tool that's gonna help you thinking for yourself, right? Even using the hex rays output, has anybody looked at hex rays decompilation of binaries? Yeah, some of you. It looks like a mess if you've never looked at this before, right? Because if you think about Try to think about when you're looking at part three, right? You're looking at the assembly code. Think about how much information is lost from that C code getting compiled down to the assembly code. And now trying to go backwards and trying to reconstruct the semantics of that original C program, it's actually a really difficult problem and it's, in, it's actively being researched. So oftentimes, uh, because what are some of the things you lose when you compile? 
Names, variable names, what else? Comments. Comments, definitely comments, what else? <laughs> Not that the comments would probably help you in the first place, but I'm not a person. Yeah? The flow of the controls, like how it switches. Yeah, so the, the control flow may be different, right? The compiler is totally free to invert um, branches if it thinks it'll be faster for compilation. Right? Even loops look basically like go-tos, right? There's no while statement in x86. It's just a branch back to itself. And that's how you get, you know, the difference between uh, for loops versus while loops versus do while. It may decompile it in a different way. Could you not tell the difference between like a library and the actual program? Just uh, it was compiled with the library. If it's statically compiled, yeah, that's really difficult. So there's a whole other host of techniques on how to deal with that. Basically. You take the library itself, you build up little signatures of what each library function is, and you try to match those to the binary. So that you know, hey, this is this library function, and it's not some other code. But yeah, when you get statically linked li uh, binaries, it's really difficult. What else? Data structures. What was that? Data structures. Data structures and types in general, right? Everything is just essentially 32-bit integers if you're using 32-bit integer addresses, right? Or bytes if you're using byte addresses. Or data structures, or structs, or all that kind of information is lost essentially when you compile it. So even if you try to use one of these tools and decompile it, it still looks like gibberish. And it probably won't compile anyways. Um, so there's a lot that you, you still have to use your brain to understand what's going on here. And you may be relying on a broken tool. Right? If you try to think and plan all of your exploits and understanding of the program based on this decompilation process, if it made a mistake, right, now you've made a mistake in your understanding, whereas if you look at the assembly code, that's what actually executes. Right? So any mistakes that are made are going to be on you and your understanding, not on some other tool that you base things off of. So I want to, they're very cool tools, but they're not, the, they're not a substitute for thinking and understanding what's going on. They can help you be more effective as you get better at this, but fundamentally it's you understanding things and thinking about things. All right. So now we're going to get into attacks. So now we're going to talk about how we can, what types of attacks we can try to, or another way to think about it is what classes of vulnerabilities are common to Unix applications. So we're going to scope down from kind of all applications we're talking about very broadly to specifically applications on Unix systems. So we may want to try to attack a network service, right, like we talked about. How would I know that a network service is running on a given machine? Yeah, I'd try to do a port scan of that machine, right? And we saw different techniques of how to do that. What else do we want to try to attack? SSH is a service. It's a network service. Start to play on their phone as 
soon as you got it. And there's a vulnerability in the rendering engine of the video encoder. And so we exploit a vulnerability in that to automatically get onto your phone from one single text message. Okay. It's still a network, you know, basically an application that's running there, just different types of input to get in there. So most of the time, so while those categories that we're thinking about are incredibly broad, most of the time, what we're looking for is a local vulnerability in a set UID root program, right? And this will, and why, why do we think this is the case? Are you just gonna, is there an intuition behind why might, this might be true? <coughs> so remote operating system vulnerabilities are the best. Are they the most common? Shouldn't they be more common then because they have the most reward? Yeah? A lot less to access, right? You can only go through the network. So you have, so if you think about it, right? Um, all of the network traffic is going through the operating system layer, right? Every machine that's deploying that operating system is executing the same code. So this is why, on one hand, it's so powerful, right? Because if I find one remote code, a remote vulnerability in, let's say, the latest version of Windows, right? Now I can exploit anybody's computer that's running Windows. It doesn't matter what they have installed, it doesn't matter anything, right? And so because of this reason, operating system developers started to take security more seriously, and Microsoft also did that in particular in the early 2000s. They completely changed the way they developed software. So, and think about over time, right, researchers focus their attention to where all the vulnerabilities could be and are most impactful, right? So they study the Linux IP stack to try to find vulnerabilities there. And so instead of like every day there's a new vulnerability, it's on the order of about once a year that will be like a really bad remote. So then why, what makes these local set UID programs different? They're individual to the computer, so they can't really have like a general standard for testing it on the machine. So yeah, individual programs, right? So there's not one standard way to test that. You can, it's difficult, but you can fuzz like a TCP IP stack fairly well to find some bugs, but how do you fuzz the CH, uh, the chain shell program? Right, C H S H. Why? Why else? Any other theories or thoughts? That'd be valid reasons for setting the privileges locally. So it's hard to so there could also be exploits of using these, you know, valid tools. Yes, yeah, so you have you have these tools, right? They need as part of your system, right? But they're not. They're not really part of the core operating system, right? They're not the TCP IP stack of Linux, right? That's where you want to go if you want to find a really impactful vulnerability, right? And so you think about all these individual system utilities across your operating, your computer, right? Any bug in any one of those programs could cause a problem, and they may be developed by completely different groups of people at different points in time. They may be different ones installed on different systems, so you may have a set of programs on each system could be different and distinct for that system, right? So testing all these things can be incredibly difficult. And so this is really the split on local privilege escalation vulnerabilities where most of the time you're gonna to try to exploit a root set UID program. Um, rarely are you actually gonna find a vulnerability in the kernel itself if you do that super cool though. So, attacking any kind of application, right? We always want to think about what? What's the important thing? How can we actually try to control the program's execution? Structure plan. Higher level. Can we just wave our magic wand at the thing? Yeah. Memory management at the OS level. Memory management at the OS level, or higher level. But how 
possibly hope to influence this system? Right? It has to take either some input from us, read from a file that we created, read from another program that we control, right? We somehow have to get our inputs into the system. If we can't do that, how are we going to attack it? You may have to become very creative in how you send input to the system, but fundamentally that input must come from you and must be controlled in some way, right? So we've seen that when the program starts up, we saw that argv comes from the attacker, right? Can come from a command line parameter, which comes from us, the attacker, right? The same with the environment. We saw the env command prints out all the environment variables, and you're exploring this in the bandit problems, Right? You're setting environment variables. That's what you, the attacker, control those environment variables. Right? So if the program, if a steady ID program is reading from environment variables, hey, that's a way we can get input into this program. We may be able to change, so you can think about this as like the startup phase of the program, right? Where the program starts up with some parameters, command line parameters, it maybe reads from some environment variables. During execution, it may use some dynamically linked objects. Um, any kind of file input where it's reading from files or writing to files on the operating system, maybe we can mess with the file system to get it to trick it to do something it's not supposed to do. Or if it's talking on sockets or talking maybe, um, if it opens up a socket to maybe talk to another program that it trusts, well, hey, we can talk on a socket. So maybe we intercept that and try to talk on there. Uh, some other things, any kind of interaction with the environment, we can try to control, right? We can try to control file creation, uh, signals. We can send signals to a process at any time, right? This is one of the important things to realize is when you're running a program in the, um, the bash command prompt, right, in your terminal, and you type in control C, what's happening there? Yeah, who sent that signal where? I think I saw the consensus among the mumble. <laughs> uh, there's one. So it is a signal. I think it's like sig term, I think, or int. Sig int? Yeah, that's right. Sig int. So who sends that? The user, the keyboard? Bash! Yes, Bash sends it, right? Remember, we talked about how does Bash execute the program? Well, it does a fork, and then it does an exec, and so the parent is still listening to your input, so when you do a control C, Bash sees that, and so it sends a signal to that process to try to terminate it. Right? You can also register other kinds of, you can even uh, use the, probably inappropriately named, kill command on Linux, you can use kill to send arbitrary signals to another process. So you can send the sig, what do we call it, sig int. You can send sig int to that process without typing in control C, and the program will, the behavior will be as if you typed in control C. Right? So that's another important thing to remember, right? That's nothing special. The same as when you do control Z, what does that do? It's an impact. Yeah, it tells it to sleep. <coughs> That's another signal. I don't know if it's safe sleep, but I would probably guess that that's what it is, or something similar. Right? So these are just predefined ways that Bash and your terminal have decided to take your input and interpret it and send it to the program in different ways. But you do not need a keyboard to do that. You can do that to things that are executed in the background. You can send any signal at any time to a program. So maybe they haven't thought about it. Well, what happens if you try to uh, tell it to sleep while it's reading a file? Right? Maybe there's some way you can alter the behavior that way. And this can be a difficult problem, right? This is part of understanding what the application does, helps you realize this is where I can try to control things. But these things start to blur, right? We have file systems and directories and file permissions and network sockets and interrupts, right? So you really have to understand what does that application do? And what are the things that that application is expecting to do? And what permissions do I have, right, as the attacker? What can I actually do, right? So if you're telling me, oh, yes, breaking this into the system is easy. You just add a new entry to the etc password file. 
bam, you're a new user on the system. Like, okay, well, but how did you do that? Well, I used sudo vim to like edit that file. Okay, but by doing that, you're becoming root on the system in order to execute that, right? You as a user can't do that, so there's no way that could possibly be used to exploit it. You have to deal with your user, your user's permissions. Okay, so very broadly, kind of the classes of attacks we're gonna have to look at are different ways that we can mess with applications when they access files. Um, we can do, very broadly, command injection attacks. We can try memory corruption attacks, which are kind of the classic, what we think of, when we think of binary exploitation is some kind of stack corruption, buffer overflow. We'll talk about heaps, we'll talk about format strings. Um, Let's see. The file access stuff is really cool because it's not normally something that you will, you will think about. Like, oh yeah, this is how you can break the security of an application. But we'll see that those can be just as powerful as any of the other ones. Let's see, I think my favorite on here, talk to is really, really interesting. Uh, it actually comes up in a lot of places. Format string is really interesting because uh, with a format string vulnerability, you have to be incredibly precise in what you're doing. Um, for some of these attacks, you can, you know, we'll see there's differences here. For some of them, it's like sledgehammer. Like, you don't have to be super precise. You can throw a bunch of data in, and like, a lot of times it'll just work. But a format string, you have to know exactly what you're doing, be very precise in order to uh, do these things properly. So, we'll start at the beginning. We'll first look at file access attacks. So, how, when your program tries to open a file, like a file, or try to, well, let's go with, um, execute a file, right? When we call the exec, when we type in ls, you know, what happens? How does it know which ls to execute? Yeah, so there's a special environment variable. Windows has exactly the same thing. If you do know, Windows development, there's, I don't know, is it called path? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, so on Unix, it's called path, all uppercase. And the different paths are, sub are separated by what? Semicolons. Semicolons, yeah, no, colons, whole colons, yeah. So you have path one, colon, path two, colon, path three. And that will specify the order that will look for whatever program is called ls, and it will find the first one in that list that it's able to find. Who controls the path environment variable? The environment variable, right? You, the user, right? So this is another way you could potentially influence applications. So there's many different things, so there's a couple different things here, right? The other way thing to think about is when an application wants to, let's say, open a file for reading or writing, what do they pass in? The open function. Location where the file is located. How does it specify the location where the file is located? How do you get a file handler? File handle. A path. You pass in a string, right, which is the path to the file that you want to open, right? And then the operating system will look up that file in the virtual file system. It will try to find that file. If it finds it, it will open it, and it will give you then a file descriptor, which that is how you will read and write to that file. Right? So this is the operating system's way of saying, okay, when you open it, you give me the string, but now I'm going to give you just this integer, and whenever you want to read or write to that file, you give me back the same integer, and that's what we'll use. So, one way we may be able to try to tamper with the application 
is what if we can partially control some of the string of the path that the application is going to open? What could you do? Change the directory that we get the file from. Change the directory where we can get the file from. So what are the parameters there? So let's say Let's say it takes the parameter from us on the command line. Then what can we do? Give it an arbitrary path that we control. Give it anything we want. We can send it to any file. So let's say we have a super simple application that looks for a password file. Right? If it takes that command line from the user, either through an environment variable or on the command line, we can just specify our own password file, and now we can bypass the application by tricking it and thinking that our password is whatever password it's looking for. What if it's opening? What if it's opening something? So let's say we have different user profiles, and it's opening, let's say slash user slash user input plus password. So let's look at let's let's think about these two. Different scenarios. I think I like drawing pictures. As the dot dot attack. Right? So essentially, even though it seems on first glance safe, right? You're appending to the file that's going to be open slash USR. So you should therefore, of course, be restricting the all access should happen on that subdirectory of slash user. Right? But the problem is. The operating system allows you to traverse directories using this dot dot notation. And so that allows us to escape. It's also known as a directory traversal attack because essentially we can arbitrarily move directories. Now, if a program allows you to do this, does that mean there's a vulnerability in that program? Yes. Remember, it comes back to knowing the application, right? If there's no check, like Vim or Emacs, can you type in Vim dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash foobar? Yes. And you want it to open up a file in whatever the parents, parents, parents directory is called foobar, right? That's intended functionality. That's what you want it to absolutely do. But if an application is using this file, in order to make some security decision, then that's when you have a vulnerability. Any questions on this? Cool. So, how do you fix this then? Yeah. Input sanitation. You just get rid what does that mean? So basically, you could like scan whatever they're trying to send in. They have a dot dot. Just get rid of it. And say invalid input. Ooh. Okay. So which one? Get rid of it or say invalid input? Invalid input is what I do. What if you did the opposite? So what if you said? Can you see that now? Another way of how to deal with this is actually what I use when I'm executing your applications on the testing infrastructure. So the ch root, anybody you know what the ch root system called us? Yeah, so it changes the root directory for a process. So uh, essentially what I'm doing is I create a subdirectory on my server, a unique and brand new subdirectory for every one of your submissions. Then, before I execute your program, I say, actually, execute the program as if this subdirectory was the root directory. So now the operating system, you can do dot dot as much as you want, as much as your little heart desires. You still can't break out and go to a higher directory there. Because the operating system literally does not allow you to do that. It thinks the start of the root file system is in the subdirectory that you're in. So you can do whatever you want in there. And then I kill your program, and then I delete that whole directory, and all traces of you are hopefully gone from my system forever. So that's your So that's the other way to deal with this problem. Other 
types of attacks. So that's the dot dot attack. Other types of attacks can we can manipulate the path environment variable and also the home environment variable. So why is the home environment variable important in terms of files? It's where our config files are. It is where our config files are at, but how does whatever application know our config files are there? Yeah. It's where the user's files are usually located. Where the user's files are located? Why is it important in terms of file access? Yeah. A lot of programs are going to assume that that's some sort of default place to start from when searching for a file. How do they specify that when they open a file? Yes. Oh, it did that before. Yes, the tilde. So yes, that. So there's actually two different ways. So tilde. Um, if you just do tilde by itself, that means your directory. So that would be your home directory. And so if a program opens, let's say, tilde slash dot something dot rc file, right, we can actually change whatever file it's going to open. So let's say it's a set UID program that's only looking for our files in our system, but we could maybe trick it by setting our home to slash root. And therefore, it's going to open root's file system. Right? So once again, the problem is dot, in a similar way, the dot dot doesn't specify a file name. Right? It specifies something relative to the current directory. The same as the tilde does not specify a specific file. It says go to the current user's home directory and look that up by looking at the home environment variable. Substitute whatever is in there and then calculate the rest of the string that we want to open. We saw and we talked about path. The path environment variable is important because it determines how the shell looks up commands that you execute. So, if the program is calling system, right, and calling system to execute some other process for it, and it says system ls, what is the file system? What is the, the system library doing? Uh, libc library. So we, 
We can trust an absolute path if we know that our user controls every directory on that path. Right? If another user can, let's say, delete a directory and put their own directory there, well, then now we're going to execute whatever they want. So it really does depend on the path. And the very first step is always specify the absolute path. It's a good practice to do whenever you're calling exec or calling out using system or something like that. Uh, you should, if you're running a set UID application, you should never use home relative paths. That's just a terrible idea. Right? Because then there's no way to control this. You, you can't know beforehand. So for an absolute path, you can know exactly where you want to put the file. Right? You, you can say, hey, I'm going to create a directory for myself when this is installed. This is how my application works and modifies this file. Right? It expects this directory structure to be like this. You don't know what user is going to be trying to edit their files, so you don't want to include a tilde in any file name that you're opening. Now we're getting the super fun stuff talking about links. So what are links in a file system? They can be, yes. So what types of links are there? Sim links, hard links, hard links. Symbolic links and hard links. So what's the difference? And what's a hard link? Actual file. Kind of. Uh, yeah, so at a high level, a symbolic link says, hey, the file that you're located in is at another location. Right? Like the princess is in another castle. Like you try to look at that file, and that file is not really a file, it's a link to go to the other file. Whereas a hard link, essentially, on the file system, points to the same physical inode that the other file points to. Um, so the operating system, essentially the program sees it as two files, it doesn't really know that they point to the same underlying file for a hard link. Where the symbolic link, you can tell that you're accessing a symbolic link here. So, this is a really cool thing. Um, that we can do, so, we make some application that they maybe read a file, they will check to see that that file exists or check to see that it's in a certain directory. So if they check to see that it's in a certain directory, what does that mean we can't do? Change the file access. Change file access. Can't use the change record, we can't use the dot dot slash attack, right? Because they're checking to make sure that the file is only in this directory, right? But if they don't check to see that it's a, an actual file and not a symbolic link, then we may be able to put a link outside that directory to some other file, right? And this depends on if we can create files in that directory or we can create links in that directory. Um, but oftentimes they will allow that. So a lot of that depends on exactly how it's configured. Um, and so this also can occur with temporary files. So if the application creates some temporary files in the local directory, it may just think that it's creating this local file and that it's set up correctly. But if you can actually point it a link to, let's say, EC password or something, you can try to get it to open that file for you. Um, and so there was an application um, that was shipped with an uh, early precursor to like the KDE and all this um, desktop environments. It created a directory with permissions 555 to create temporary files. And so what it would do is it would try to look in for this var dt app config app manager generic display zero. And so by creating a symbolic link from this file to an actual file that you want to edit, so it would use this generic display zero and it would write to that file because it was root, it could do this. By creating a symbolic link, so the way to, way to read links is um, you want the link to be, I think of it like a copy almost, where you're copying, 
So like you're creating a link called var dt app config app manager generic display zero, and that link points to etc shadow. If you think of it in this points to relationship, it always seems backwards because you're putting the destination first and then the source. Um, so if you think of like you're kind of copying, it's like the same as copying, like you're copying quote quote etc shadow to this thing. Okay, so that's how I come to rationalize it in my head. I don't know if that helps. And so then when you run this dtap gather function, it would say that, hey, this file exists. And if you look at etc shadow, it would call chmod 555 on that directory because that was supposed to be the permissions there. So when the operating system does this, it says, OK, 555 on this file, great. OK, it's a link. That means I need to do 555 on this actual file. And so using that, you're able to change the permissions of any file on the system that root can control, which is literally everything. So uh, you don't get write permissions, and you can't change anything on there. So let's look at the etc shadow file. Patches. Yeah, so we didn't talk about that. So etc password, as we saw, was that colon separated list of all of the users on the system. So it was the user's login name, the user ID, the group ID, the shell, and there was a field that was an asterisk for all of them. So what that means is that the actual user's password is stored in the etc shadow file. But it's not the actual password, it's a hash of the password. So why don't you want to put the passwords of all the users in the etc password file? It almost seems like by the name that was what it was for. And it was. <laughs> why is that a bad idea? Yeah. In case something goes wrong, this is a very sought after target, so. Yeah, so how do you, well, it's a very sought after target. What are the permissions on the etc password file? Owned by root and group, but what are the permissions? Yeah, readable by anyone, right? Which makes sense. You needed, this is all the users on the system. Everybody needs to look at that to see who the users are and if the user exists, right? There's a lot of good reasons to have that. But now you're saying, okay, everyone on the system can see even the hash version of everyone's password. Uh, that's probably not great. Uh, and so that's why they separate out this functionality. So the etc shadow file by default is only readable from root, right? It's not readable from anyone else. And so that way, this is all the password checking is done using this etc shadow file. So what I can do is I can, now that I can read the shadow file, I can take it. And there are programs like John the Ripper that you can run that will just try a bunch of password cracking on that file. And I guarantee you somebody on there has a really crappy password, right? Especially if you're using a, um, if you're on a big multi-user system, you're going to get some interesting stuff there. Yeah? We get, will we get through any assignments where we're going to use like, tools like that? Mm, I, no. I think it's not that fun. Like you're just running a password hack cracker on it, right? You're using somebody else's stuff. You can make your own. Um, yeah, you can do that too. Um, I think what's more interesting is finding this vulnerability in there first, right? So you need this first step, right? Like the DTAP gatherer, right, has some code that looks correct, but is actually wrong, right? It's making this, uh, it's creating this but it's not checking into the file or not, and then it's setting the permissions, right? Which allows you to then leverage that to do all this other crazy stuff. I mean, I think it's fun. I think you should spend some time like, downloading password hashes and using John the Ripper to crack them. Um, but, yeah. And there's actually a whole interesting thing about how you, like, guess good passwords. So, uh, or how you guess things so you're likely to get uh, to break passwords. But in this current focus, most of them are focused. So what? So now what do you need to do? Now what do you need to keep in mind when you do this? Yes. So in the previous slide, we, yes. we use the soft link, right? Yes. But what soft link does is just create an I know a different I know and link to the same file. Yes. So why why does operating system needs to change the permissions for the the original? Oh, the permissions, I believe that's part of the nature of a symbolic link. So if you look 
at a symbolic length, the permissions should be 777. Everybody can see that. Yeah, but, but I don't know why it's writable. Okay. So if we use hard link, then it's OK to go with this. But if we interpret, I know it's different than what the need to change the permission of the original file. What's the need to do it? Or why does the OS allow you to change the file permissions of a symbolic link? So part of it is this is just the application's functionality. So the application basically says, hey, try to create, so you can see like the error here, the make directory. So it's like, make this file and then, or make this directory and then chmod it 555. Right, so it's doing that part. Um, that's in the code itself. But it's not checking that that make directory failed and then not doing the chmod. It's trying to make the directory, the operating system says, hey, the directory already exists. It goes, great, we'll chmod that 555. And so the operating system looks it up, goes, okay, chmod 555, this thing, looks it up, and then chmod the, the thing that it links to. So that's just the nature of the functionality of symbolic links in the operating system. You could probably argue whether that's a good or bad thing, if the OS should do that or not, and I would agree, but you kind of, at this point, you just have to deal with whatever's there, right? So how do we stop this? How do we fix it? Yeah. Check for symbolic links. Yeah, so we should check what type of file we're opening, right? So we can try to do that, and we can try to look for symbolic links. Uh, what's another kind of sub? So this was using what it thought was a temporary file. But was the name random at all? It was a constant. It was a constant location, right? So this is kind of the flip side of this example: is that temporary files should not be predictable, right? Your application should not try to create its own temporary files for use by itself, and if it does, I mean. You definitely shouldn't have them be predictable. So there's a function called uh, make s temp, and it actually is really annoying because there's a function called make temp. What do you think the s stands for? Secure. Secure. Yes, I always hate it when they like put a, such important word as one minor letter. Like, if you were to like design these from a UI perspective, you'd call one like make secure use this one. And if you really want to be secure, you just never actually have the other one. And if you have to have it, you call it make, make temp not secure, don't use this. <laughs> right? That'll maybe actually get people to do it, yeah. Uh, I was working for a big corporation here, and they had this tool that they used to put computers onto the domain. Mm -hmm. And that tool would create a temporary file, and inside of there would be the BB script that had the admin password and everything that it ran to put you on it. So when you realize it's there, you can go in and change the uh, permissions so that the program can't delete the files that it makes mm -hmm. in temp. Yeah. And then when you do that, it fills up with question marks. So then it's like, okay, we'll just prevent it from modifying the file. Mm -hmm. So it can create it, but it can't modify it. So then it, would, it created this file and left the admin username and password there, which I could then use to put any computer on the network I wanted. Yes, which is very bad. It just happens all, this is not like an, an abstract thing. This happens in a lot of different scenarios, and it's exactly this, right? So that's why this make s temp guarantees the operating system will find a directory or a file for you, depending on which parameters you pass. It will make sure that that file does not exist beforehand. It will give it a unique name, and it will guarantee that only your user can read and write to that file. And this way, you don't have any of these problems that you can have. All right, and we will stop here before we get on to talk to you with that.